The reason why I do forgiveness is because grief, the process through which forgiveness and grief almost usually are identical to some degree. They're, they're not the same thing, but boy, are they similar. So I'm on page four. I like to always start with the forgiveness is not, or I should have said forgiveness is not, or not usually, or probably not. <laughs> That's not always a blanket. Because these are things I've heard through the years all the time. We hear this in birthday cards, Hallmark cards, greeting cards, sermons, songs. These are the trite conventional wisdom things people say. Forgiveness means, number one, that I'm okay with what happened to me. Well, that's completely false. Forgiveness does not mean I'm okay with it. Evil is evil, and we should always hate what is evil. Paul says it explicitly in Romans 12, 9. Hate or abhor what is evil. And that sounds very Jewish, because it was. No, we do not like evil. And the need to forgive, we're going to see in a second, is to address something that happened that you consider to be evil towards you, or really, really hurtful, even accidentally. But it's a bad thing. Forgiveness does not mean you come to the place you go, I'm okay with it. Just like in grief, you remember? You come to a place of acceptance doesn't mean, I'm okay that that happened. I like that that happened. That's not what closure means. It doesn't mean you like it. Um, so it doesn't mean I'm, I like what happened. Oh, it's not that. Number two, forgiveness means I need to be reconciled with the offender. False. I hear this one all the time. Would you forgive them? Then why aren't you together anymore? The assumption is that forgiveness and reconciliation are the same thing, and they are not the same thing. Forgiveness and reconciliation are not the same thing. They're different words, different concepts, different Greek and Hebrew. They're different. They're just different. Restoration with the person who hurt you is your choice and should be based on healthy boundaries. Always, period. There's no but, there's no comma, whatever, no just period. You may forgive the person and never talk with her again. Ever. Ever. You can love her from a distance. You can love her from Alaska. Uh, you can forgive them from China. You may never talk to them again and say, I forgive you. And this is extremely important when we talk about healthy boundaries because some people are stinking toxic. They are wounded and sick people and they will harm and hurt and come after you. They will use you. They will abuse you emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually. There are wolves and some wolves are even in sheep's clothing as Jesus of Nazareth said. And we are deluded and so, and I'll get worked up about this frankly because of my last work church experience. I do, I still get worked up about it. Because what, usually what Christians do is, using a sense of cowardice, they baptize it and stick their hand in the metaphorical sand and go, oh, no, no, just pray about it. Just, just forgive them. And, oh, they, they mean well. That is false. You need to read the New Testament. That's false. There are wolves. There are vipers. John the Viper calls it. You are a brood of vipers. You know what vipers do? You get, up all that, you get near them, they go, ah, they get you, they kill you, they hurt you. There, there are some bad people in the world, and they can be forgiven without being reconciled. Some of the healthiest things Christians do sometimes is say, I'm absolutely having a complete distance. I'm cutting off the relationship if I choose to, if they refuse to be a safe place for me. It can be that way. It doesn't have to be. You can forgive and get reconciled. Wonderful. Praise God. Woo! But they're not the same thing. You can forgive and not reconcile the relationship. That's possible. I will unpack that a lot more in this study. Uh, that is possible. I'm not saying it is the case. I'm saying it's possible. Three Christians are to forgive and forget. Kiss and make up. As someone said a second ago, forgive and forget. That's right. Well, the answer is that's kind of false. It's kind of false. Is it true that Christians forgive and forget in the sense that we're supposed to get to the place where we no longer hold against a person what they've done against us? Yeah. If that's what you mean by forgive and forget, okay. But when this belief usually forgive and forget, kiss and make up. It usually means we got to skip over the grief stage. Just get over it. Cowboy up, cowgirl up, just, maybe it's a Southern experience that you don't use in Illinois, but man up, get over it. That's, that's false nonsense. And that's usually how it's used. Well, I get, I'm a forgive and forget Christian. That means I just dismiss it no matter what it is. This is not only not found in the Bible, there's no word that says forgive and forget in the Bible. It's counterintuitive, time and memory works. I'm going to work hard on forgiving that, forgetting this. It means you're thinking about it. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Ignoring our past doesn't make it go away. It just doesn't. And you say, David, I can think of many things in life that I can just get over real quickly. Good. Good. They're probably minor offenses. What I'm saying is forgiveness does not necessarily mean that you're able to get it. Just get over it. You never experience it. I can usually, in my experience, humbly speaking, that's usually just a throwaway defense mechanism because I don't want to suffer the pain. I don't want to think about what really happened to me. And so I just got to forgive and forget. Sounds good, sounds Christian, sounds noble. 
And all you're doing is telling your wounded child to shut up, be quiet. You, you should be over this by now. You need to forgive and forget it. And your wounded child's going, yeah, but what happened to you? Can't we talk about what happened to me? Not on minor stuff. They stepped on my toe. Oh, need attention. Well, maybe a little bit. But big stuff, it's not the same as forgive and forget. It's just not. So we don't just skip over the grieving stage of forgiveness. For forgiveness is a feeling towards someone. Well, it's somewhat true. That's somewhat true. Forgiveness is somewhat like a feeling. But, but primarily it's a choice one takes regardless of whether you feel like doing it. And that's very important as most people think forgiveness is I don't, I don't feel like forgiving. We'll talk a lot about this. If that's you and me, we're, we're misguided. We don't wait on mustering feelings before we forgive. Feelings will be affected, but not the measure of where you're forgiving. You can, be, you can have forgiven someone and still have hurt. They're not the same thing. And I'll talk about what I mean by that in a little bit. They're related. There's no doubt they're related. There's no doubt. But they're not exactly the same thing. So forgiveness is a feeling towards someone, kind of. But not necessarily, because we don't wait a muster up a feeling. Okay, number five, forgiveness is usually fast. Well, that depends. There's no set time for emotional, psychological health. The steps are the most important. Get along. Um, there's sometimes you go, you know what? All of a sudden, I felt like God gave me the grace to go. I'm over it. I forgive them. Other times, we go, I thought I did, but now I feel like, no. Well, that was years ago. Yeah. So don't judge yourself if it took you longer than you thought. <coughs> Number six, real forgiveness is only necessary when something really bad occurred. Well, that's false. Emotional healing is always necessary. Some hurts take longer than others. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. That, that process of forgiveness just depends. I meet so many people who say bad things about themselves. I know I ought to be over this by now. I know I'm too old for this. I know better, but I know I should be having enough faith. I mean, all that condemnatory junk. You don't know better than God. And if you're a Christian, Paul says, and I think he was right when he said this in Romans 8, 1, therefore there is no what? Condemn stinking nation in Christ Jesus. It's in the Greek. It says that. Condemn stinking nation. There is no God. So why in the world are you doing it? That's the question. Why do people walk around saying a bunch of crap junk about themselves? And I was a kid, crap meant junk. Some people think it's a cuss word. I don't think Why say that junk about yourself when God does not do that? Anyway, I'm going to fall off. Anyway, um, sometimes we do. No, point is, I should be over this. Stop the should. Stop that nonsense. If it takes a while, it takes a while. So what? Number seven, just give it time, right? Time heals all wounds. That's nonsense. In general, that, that's nonsense. But it does depend. When there's a significant loss, time don't, doesn't heal anything. Some sting goes away, the sting of it. But the healing process takes time. So giving it time alone is not good enough. Giving it time alone doesn't forgive serious offenses. Is it something minor? Well, sure. Was I offended as a fifth grader? I'm sure, I bet I don't remember almost anything in fifth grade, some things, but I don't remember when I was offended in the fifth grade. So I forgot. Yeah, that's true about some things. But not if my spouse walked out on me, not if someone raped me or, or robbed me or something. Well, it was a long time ago. Sometimes you gotta, just depends. And number eight, not forgiving punishes the other person. Now, no one says it that way, but that's what we think. If I, for, let me say it this way, if I forgive the person, I let them off the hook. Well, there's some truth in that, but that's back to number one. It's not saying I like what happened. So for not forgiving, it doesn't punish them. It genuinely only hurts you. The only person who hurts is you. Resentment is like an internal sickness that damages you. It's like lighting a fire that you're the only one gets burned. It's like drinking poison that hurts you. Forgiveness is not for the other person. And not forgiveness is not hurting the other person. It just doesn't work that way. I have known people in my life who live a carefree life, not giving a rip about the pain they cause me. They're not, oh, if only David would forgive me. It doesn't work that way. They don't give a rip. That's, that's the way it is. I don't, you know. I like how uh, Warren Skinner's in this one book called uh, that Sue, this what's well, an article actually in the journal Family Therapy. She says there are a number of types of forgiveness that are inauthentic. I'm not going to unpack all this. I just I put this list to help maybe it resonates with you, perhaps. Thank you. Good. A couple of things might resonate with you, like letter A, instantaneous forgiveness. 
That is, before any account of the offense at all. It's okay, it's okay, it's God forgive you, forgive you. Before I even figure, before, before, before I even label what happened to me, it's just instantaneous. Hey, it's no big deal, it's no big deal, it's no big deal. And I've heard people say it all the time, they're like, hey, I'm sorry, so and so. It's okay, it's okay. Well, that's instantaneous. And that, that's usually from your childhood trauma. You're, you're so scared of losing a person or abandonment or getting hurt. If you held a grudge, you were taught all and all that stuff. But instantaneous forgiveness, no matter what, that's not good. Be arrested forgiveness that is, is denied by one or both parties in conflict. That is, I, I choose to hold on to this. I choose to hold on to it. That's not healthy. Uh, see conditional forgiveness. Yeah, maybe if. Real forgiveness gives, if you get to the place where it's full acceptance and you don't feel, I'll tell you about that in a second. D, pseudo forgiveness means it's false, it's premature that you think you have. I've done that myself. I know that one. I know I've, I thought I forgave them because I defined it differently and I come to find out, no, I haven't. Uh, it's, yeah. Collusive forgiveness, unconditional capitulation by the victim to avoid opposition or conflict without a behavior change by the offender. And that's the one there, I'd put it a little different. I would say that sounds like reconciliation. And they mean is there is, um, I don't want you to be upset with me, so I'll forgive you no matter what, even though the person might still be toxic or might hurt you. I wouldn't put that in this category because that's reconciliation, but I just quoted this whole thing. And then E, repetition forgiveness, successive incomplete attempts to deal with the problem. And that's common in counseling. They'll say, I, I, I keep trying to forgive them over and over through the years. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried. And um, that doesn't mean the person's a villain. That might just be misunderstood what forgiveness is. And they keep, maybe they're just hurting, but they have forgiven. So again, I'm not, you can read that article if you want. I'm not gonna unpack all that right now, but there's different ways we get around it. We say, I'm not there yet. So basically, we usually know if we've not forgiven, deep down, really, if we don't feel the closure, a lot of times just, something's up. So my hope is during this, this tonight and maybe next week, that was it, we just reflect on some of this and maybe it helps us get some closure on what forgiveness looks like and how to do it, what it is, what it isn't. What forgiveness is not? Any questions or comments about what it's not? Where? Oh, the over one offense. You sort of have to process it. Yeah. Then that's why I'd probably say the person... Again, in a judgment sense, but they probably, if a person says that was something, say, years ago, it hasn't happened since, it was a one time or whatever, it's in the past, and I keep finding myself, I think I completely forgave them, and then something happens again. In those instances, when I, when I counsel a person, I'll say, well, before we conclude you have not forgiven, let's first assume you're wounded and you haven't healed yet. Now, those go together. They're just, in my view, they're not the same. And so I'll say here in just a second is, I'm convinced you can reach a psychological state of forgiveness before the emotions can catch up. And some people disagree with that. They go, no, 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 no. Until all your emotions are caught up, you've not come to closure and forgiveness yet. Respectfully, I disagree only because of the New Testament. The New Testament, and I'll, I'll, I'll argue the case in just a second. That's a great, so that's a good question. So my view is if someone's still having a struggle with that over and over, I'd say, well, maybe you're just not healed or grieved enough. They say, no, no, I'm really, I will say, and say I still want them to be punished. Okay, I do not forgive them. Maybe, you, maybe it sounded good at the time, or maybe you, I don't know. At the same time, I don't spend much energy when I'm counseling a person trying to identify. That's called non-forgiveness. I'm more interested in trying to figure out, okay, let's talk about it. If you're still sad and you're angry, maybe you're tapping into anger. That's perfectly normal. If someone's hurt you terribly, it's a traumatic event, and if you rethink it, I gave an analogy last week of a, a boat in our mind going from pier to pier, and he picks up, we pick up our cargo and just drag it with us. We're not supposed to do that. But if we stop at the pier and we stare down memory lane, we can get angry, sad, worked up. That's normal. And that doesn't mean I'm not forgiving the person. It just means my brain is going, oh, yeah, that really, that, that stunk a lot. So I tend to do that more than I spend energy labeling it. Uh, so I wonder if I have suspicion what Dr. Sue here is saying is that if a person does this, yeah, I forgave them. You just kind of move on quickly. It's kind of like, don't worry about it. That's what I suspect. What forgiveness is? Okay, so I use this straight up from the New Testament because of the, the Greek word, I don't know if you want to see on the board, is if, uh, the chief one used, like 95% or roughly, is the word is aphiemi, aphiemi. And that means, it means to set free, to release the need for retribution, vengeance, or punishment, which genuinely is only God's prerogative. That is to say, God alone genuinely forgives. Because ultimately, all offenses, all evil, all sin is an affront to him first and foremost. That sounds maybe crazy to us because we're humans, but as Christian worldview, that's not crazy at all. 
Chief and foremost, every sin is chief foremost. It's kind of like saying, it's not the same. I mean, any analogy here breaks down, because at least it seems to me, I can't think of a really good analogy. The closest I can think of is in my children. Well, my children were little particularly, even maybe now, if they argue. But to say when they were real young, if they, um, they got mad and hit each other, which I can't stand. We, were, we have a zero tolerance policy on physical hurting ever. I don't care, Julia Hayden, I don't care if I was in line to meet Jesus. I would have got the rear and out. We would have got, I called him a Jesus. We would have called what a timeout talk, and they got scared of those. I'm glad they did. Um, when they did that to each other occasionally, my trigger went up. Oh, don't do that. No one in my appendix, none of my home will ever enact violence to another person. But in the moment, Hayden might have said, but Julia hit me. Or Julia might have said, Hayden hit me. And I'm sorry about that too, but no one in my family, in the sense of immediately I got worked up. Not like I couldn't control myself, but I mean, it triggered, I mean, that's a, like running in the street. I don't care where we were, I don't care who I was talking to, if my kid's in the street, I'm about to be rude and leave that conversation and grab the room and pull in and we're gonna have a serious talk. You don't ever do that. So if there's safety involved, violence involved, screaming or cussing, those kind of things, it's a reflection on me and daddy and mama. We don't do that. So God ultimately is that. But we can forgive other people, and it means to set it free, to release it. The need for what? Punishment. The need for retribution. The need for vengeance. The need, the emotional, psychological need for them to get it. They're due. Forgiveness is that. Forgiveness means I don't need or want you to be punished for what you did. I do not need or want you to be punished for what you did. When God does it, it means he won't punish them. Forgiveness of other humans, by us, or other humans to other humans, is the process by which we heal emotional and psychological wounds that have occurred by releasing emotional resentment and anger that demands punishment or restitution. I'm going to read that one more time for people online, for people on the podcast. Forgiveness of other humans is the process by which we heal emotional and psychological wounds that have occurred by releasing emotional resentment and anger that demands punishment or restitution, making the scales of justice right again. I just saw a news clip today, right before I was coming here, of a, a kid at a school who murdered these kids, shot him up, and he was over trial, and he, he, he takes the mask off, and, tell, and all the, the victim's parents are in the crowd, they're all crying and stuff, I mean, just... And they go up there saying, this guy shot and murdered, blah, blah, blah. And he comes up and says, I know y'all decide for me whatever it is and so forth. And then the, the, the judge says, you realize you, you think they're going to decide that don't a jury does. You understand that, right? Goes, yeah, and blah, blah. Well, it cuts through the interview. One of the parents said, what do you think has happened? What do you want him to have to happen to him? And she said, nothing more than, she meant nothing less than. She said, nothing more than the death penalty. So by definition, she has not forgiven him. By definition, she wants him punished. By definition. And years ago, was that an Amish country? They got him in and shot up all the place, and the Amish people at the trial, the judge gave him a hug and said, we forgive you. I mean, just what kind of crazy world people, I mean, only in a Christian worldview could you ever think that would be, that's exactly what they did. They said, we don't want him punished. We don't want this person to go to jail. We forgive him. Shot up other kids, kids. That's forgiveness. Now, the wound, the wound that we experience, that means the forgiveness, it becomes integrated, or I like the metaphor some psychologists use, metabolized, like eating food and it gets in our body and our nutrients. It gets all metabolized. It becomes part of us. At least most of it. Otherwise, it comes out other places. But it becomes metabolized, turns into protein to muscle. That wound becomes metabolized. It becomes integrated as part of our past. It happened. It's just part of our past. It is not something avoided. I can't go there, can't go there, can't go there. Nope, nope. And it's not relived every time we think about it. And that's why I give this analogy, a boat on the water that keeps picking up hooks attached to other boats or cargo. Our goal is to detach them. And when we see them again in our minds, we just pass them by, acknowledging, yep, that's what happened to me. But you know for a fact, if someone lost a loved one, every time you talk about the loved one, they start weeping on the spot, they've not fully grieved it out yet. If someone's been hurt or harmed, and they say, oh, that son of a blah, 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 they haven't forgiven yet. It, that anger is so fresh, they can't wait for that person to be punished. So, but when you've forgiven a person, 
that wound becomes integrated. You go, it did happen. Now, if I sat here and retold the whole story to Jennifer, I'd probably get really mad again. It would surface emotions. But the emotions do not mean I want that person punished because I forgave a long time ago. Yeah, that was horrible when I went through it. I hated it. I hated it. But, I, but they always come up with a, but I came to a place of that's in my past and I forgave them. Now, what the government does to that person is a different issue because governments don't typically forgive. All right, governments are there for justice. But humans, for other humans can forgive other humans. So forgiveness is not about reconciliation uh, and it's not only just about feelings. We choose to forgive. We choose to get to a place where we work on ourselves enough that we don't have the kind of resentment, anger that wants them to get it, to get their due, for justice to be enacted. Forgiveness means we don't do that. I've set them free from punishment. So we'll type up, I'll top page five. Uh, but those are good examples of just simple griefs, you might say. Um, so top page five, forgiving yourself. Now, when you've sinned, people say, have you forgiven? This is real common in psychology to say you need to forgive yourself. And most Christian teachers get really worked up about this. They get mad. You can't forgive yourself. Well, that's true. You and I do not have the authority to forgive ourselves. Only God forgives sins. That is true. Theologically, that's completely true. You don't have the authority to forgive sins. Yet, this is what I say all the time, yet, one can use the expression forgiving yourself in the sense of grieve and accept the fact that I failed. Move past how much I've disappointed myself and my values. That is very important to do. You and I all have, all of us do, we all have values. We, we, we have them. We just, we do psychopaths, psy so we, they all have them. I mean, I've, I've heard interviews of, of sociopaths. They go, well, I didn't want to do blah, blah. One guy was a serial killer. He would get women, beat them up. One in particular, he chained up. After he beat her up, she took martial arts and still, he, yeah, she put up one of a heck of a fight. He chains her up to a tree and then he takes all their money and uses their bank account, account to get money until finally they run out and then he would kill them. Well, this one woman, he did that, but she had a dog. And the guy goes, we eventually he got in around the money, got tired, so he just got a bat and killed the woman. And, he, and the, the police officer, did you kill the dog? No, no, I could never do that. <laughs> I could never kill that dog. <laughs> I mean, he's, oh, no, he's like, what a stupid question. That's their value. In other words, it doesn't matter what, they, they have these values. And then whenever we betray our own values, we feel badly about that. We feel guilty about it. We do. We just do. And so forgiving yourself means grieving and accept the fact that I failed my own desires. And this can be a very pernicious thing because if we fail ourselves often, we start losing something that's very important to have. And I'll, I'll stick here just for a second. And that is we stop trusting ourselves. We really do stop trusting ourselves. And... People who stop trusting themselves can get into real bad depression. This is very common in any kind of addiction. Very, very common people struggle with addictions. I'll, people who eat too much. I know I ought not to, but I know I ought to, but I, I can't pass those brownies. I can't pass the donuts. I can't pass that sugar, whatever it might be. And they eat, eat, and they go, I'm not going to do it anymore, and I do it. I'm not going to do it anymore, and I do it. I'm not going to drink one more drink. I'm going to do one more drink. Pass the bar. And it, that we call it halt. Halt is up. Four common, oh, oh Lord. I'm about to halt right now. Four common triggers, you know, forgive me. Uh, hunger, alone, loneliness, no, anger, sorry. Hunger, anger, loneliness, and tired. These are very common four triggers that make us do the things we don't want to do. So hunger, anger, loneliness, and being tired. And then what happens is we tell ourselves, I know I'm not going to do, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better, better, and you don't. Eventually what happens is we have a deep sense of distrust, like, I can trust myself. Deep inside of me, I really don't want to do that, like to Romans 7, but I do it anyway. That's not the life of a Christian. I'm just saying it sounds like that. And, and that, that's a big deal. When this happens, what I do encourage people when they find themselves, they have failed people. Maybe it was one time people have had an affair. And it was one time, and they've never done it since, and they so regret it so badly, and they just live in constant guilt. And so we work on this, on the, in the sense of forgiving yourself, not because you're God, 
You're not forgiving a sin, but you're coming to some grieving except that you failed your own morals. You disappointed yourself, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Well, let's grieve that fact. What do you do with the fact that you fail your own desires, your own values? And it's double bad when you're a Christian because you're like, I mean, I know I know better. <laughs> Jesus said this, and I still fail him. So when we choose behavior that we regret, we should condemn our behavior. That's all put in italics. Behavior, confess it and receive his forgiveness. And to prove the point, if you have a Bible, Bible app, we're going to turn to 1 John 1. That's all the far right side of your Bible. Before you get to Revelation, 1 John 1, 8 to 10. But this only is true if you're Christian. If you're not a Christian, this doesn't apply to you. 1 John 1, 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, like however, he who is faithful and righteous or just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yep, that's true. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So you don't deny that you've sinned, but if you're a Christian, you confess it, that's over. Look in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, he means his people at church, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, a paracletus, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. That is anybody who confesses it. So we should confess whenever we have sinned the behavior. We should condemn that behavior. We should look square in the face that behavior was awful. I said all the time to people when they, they fail themselves, it's no fun at all. I'll say, before you go jump over and go as quickly as you can to forgiveness, I know I'm not condemned, Jesus forgives me. Yes, yeah, 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 he does. But don't jump over too quickly. Pause for a little and let it sting. Let it sting. Look at the failure right in the eyes, metaphorically speaking. Lord help him. Look at that failure right in the eyes and let it sting that I have failed. Let, don't jump too quickly because you may not learn your lesson. If I touch that burner and it hurts my hand, I go, it's over, never mind. Wait a second, that really hurt. I won't touch that thing that's glowing red. We learn that it's natural, logical consequences as a child. We're supposed to learn that. And same thing when we do our own false behavior, when wrong behavior, a sin. But we do get his forgiveness. And that's very important. Behavior is not us. We should not condemn ourselves and keep a constant attitude of shame. That's the difference between guilt and and shame. It is so important that you get this. And most Christians in my life don't get this. They use these terms interchangeably. Use it from well-intentioned pastors. Guilt and shame. So, if you can see that. Guilt is about behavior. Shame is about the self. Guilt says what I did was wrong. Shame says I am wrong. I am bad. Guilt says what I did was wrong was bad. Shame says I am wrong or bad. Shame is not Christian. Certainly not as a Christian, it's not. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5 21. Romans 8, 1, therefore there is no condemnation for those Christ Jesus. Those who are uh, enslaved by the law of sin has now been set free by the spirit of life giving. I mean, this is, this is basic Christianity 101. You need to get this. Christians are not supposed to be feeling shame anymore. John says, hey man, don't sin. But if you do sin, you've got an advocate with Christ Jesus. He's on your side. He's pleading your case. Woo! You just got to confess it. Confess the behavior that guilt has taken away. Notice John did not say, you better beg for forgiveness. You better give penance, say 13 Hail Marys, and give to the church. Then you'll be forgiven. None of that is in the Bible. All Christians have to do is just confess it. That's it. Homologeo in Greek. It means to say the same thing. You just confess. You say the same thing that happened. That happened, and I did that thing. I'm saying the same thing of what happened. That's confession. And that behavior is, can be bad. I need to get that guilt. That is not the same as I am bad. You do not condemn yourself. And that's what a lot of people, if you have toxic uh, shame, toxic shame is usually you grew up as a child and a whole host of things can cause this. If you have trauma from your past, 
It feels so natural to feel shame, to feel like it's right, it's good to dog myself. Things like, I'm so awful, I'm a horrible person, I'm a weirdo, I'm such a loser, I'm such a klutz, I'm so, so clumsy, I, I'm so dumb, I'm so slow, I'm so lazy. The stuff people say about themselves, don't get stuck in this. You grieve it, you confess it, you receive God's forgiveness, and you've got to let it go. God is the judge and you are not, period. God is the judge and you are not. You don't know more than God, you're not more righteous than God. No, 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 David. You don't know what I've done. I don't know what you've done. What I know is I'm pretty good at theology because I've, I've studied this for quite some time. What I do is you're not God. God is in the office of God, and God gets to determine who's forgiven or not. And when the New Testament is overwhelmingly clear, it's not clear a lot of things in my opinion. What it is overwhelmingly clear on is that when Jesus died on the cross for our sins and we give our life to him, we have been forgiven. We've been forgiven. It's, it's, it's way back then. 2,000 years ago, I was handled. That debt was paid. I don't still have a debt. Well, what if I sin? I get another $20 debt? No, it doesn't work that way. I confess that that debt was covered. It was covered. All potential sins are. And it feels good to beat ourselves up sometime when you have shame. It feels right. But if you're in Jesus, you're no longer condemned. So again... If you do fail, when you do fail yourself and you fail your own values and we sin, we mess up, we sin doesn't mean I'm a boo-boo mistake. Sin means you deliberately rebelled against something God said, don't do that, you did it anyway. When we do that, what do we do? John says, this is one of several passages, we confess it. I look in the eyeball as it were, I stare at this exactly what I did and it was wrong and God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I blew it on purpose. Now, Lord Jesus, please help me. I'm going to be sad. I'm going to cry. I might need a journal. I might need to turn up a bunch of Adele songs and just cry my eyeballs out. Got to call my friends. Oh, I can't believe I did it. And look, if it's really bad, you might even cry for months. Okay, grieve. But the second you start saying, I'm a bad person, you are disagreeing with the Lord Jesus. You're disagreeing with God. Who's going to win that one? What? Why would you want to disagree with God? Don't do it. Well, I'm a horrible wretch. No, you were a horrible wretch before you came to Jesus. Now you're a new creation, a saint. You just blew that back. That behavior was wrong. Imagine every single time my children, every single time they do something that they didn't do something, or take the dogs out to pee and they don't, they pee in the house. What kind of loser boy are you? What a sorry, no good, lazy. Imagine if I said that because one time or the second or third. What if any time you ever did it, I start saying, you're a wretch. Because he made a mistake or he deliberately said, forget you, Dad. That would be horrible, wretched. A lot of people hear that. They grow up hearing that nonsense. But that's false. It's completely unrelated. And I, I get worked up because it breaks my heart. Because <coughs> years and years and years of counseling people who do not do this well. It feels good to beat themselves up. And some people don't even like counseling because if I start saying what I just said right now, it feels so weird and it feels so uncomfortable to think they don't, that they should be punishing themselves. They don't want to hear it. And that's how abused they have been. That's how, and this is particularly common amongst anybody, but certainly emotionally abused women in marriages. I've met women years and years and years and years here, well, husband, you're a little good, you're horrible, blah, blah, blah. And man, that stuff is hard to get out. Or childhood. And I'll say, no, 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 no. So, it, that's in general. Now I'm being very specific, and that is forgiving yourself. So when we choose behavior, condemn the behavior, confess it, receive his forgiveness, we don't condemn ourselves. It was bad. I am not. It was, does that make sense? I'll move on. I'll let you charge that sermon. But any questions or comments about that? So, David, can we forgive ourselves? Technically, no. You're not God. But if you mean by that, he'll process it. Grieve the fact that you blew your own values? Yes. And that's, if that's what you mean by that, sure. That's my opinion. You can use different words, whatever. Well, David, forgiving God, that just makes me mad. We can't forgive God. Why'd you even bring it up? Because <laughs> I'm a pastor. I've been around the real world. God doesn't sin, thus he doesn't need to be forgiven. I mean, that's theologically, yes. That's why that's the first sentence. Moreover, no one could possibly judge or condemn God. Okay, all right. My encouragement here is don't get stuck in the critical parent ego state with God. I mean, you've lost already. Well, you should have. 
I talked about that in a sermon a few weeks ago. Well, he just should have done this and he should have. That's what happens. We get, we insult, we're insulted because the question is, when did he become in the defense? Why, why is he in the dock and you became the judge? And that's a very modern problem. We're never in any superior position to God. Yet, however, just like with forgiving yourself, that's good theology. Yet, one can use his expression in the sense of grieve and accept the fact that God didn't do what I thought he would. Okay. If that's what you mean, in my opinion, sure. If that's what you mean by that. So many people refuse to let go of the resentment they have toward God. They're offended. They're insulted. They're mad at him. Fully accept the fact that God is utterly free from any external compulsion. God's ways are not yours, period. His timing is not yours. His will is not determined by what you want. And most importantly, God is good and can be trusted. It's just not. God's ways are not yours or mine. His timing is not this. Well, he should have done that. It does not, period. He's completely free. Your desires that he should have done it doesn't, doesn't matter. He doesn't go, he's right. Sue did want it. Now what do I do? David, he's a good guy. Oh, I feel awful. I shouldn't have blown it. I mean, it's not going to happen. And as a Christian, we say fundamentally God is good and he can be trusted. And like my sermon, I said, Matthew eleven six. 6, Jesus said, blessed is the one who doesn't take offense at me, Jesus said. And I would say, blessed is one who doesn't offense at God and his ways. Nothing in Christianity teaches Christians are exempt from immersing immense suffering and sadness. And Jesus even told us to expect it. John 16, 33, in the world you will have trouble. You will have trouble. James 1, 2 to 8. I mean, consider all pure joy when trial comes against you. I mean, that's just two places. I mean, there's numerous places. We're expecting it. This week coming up, I'm going to talk about Paul and talks about the sufferings he went through and some, some of that. I'll give a glimpse of it. So, forgiving God, no, you don't literally theologically forgive God. You're not God. He doesn't sin. If you mean healing, I really thought God would do blank and he didn't and I got to be sad about that fact? Absolutely. That's just like saying if Jennifer said, I really thought I would do better and I blew it and I need to grieve that fact. You're not technically forgiving yourself. You're Grieving the fact that you thought you would do better. Same thing with God. I thought he would do this. I expected him to do this. He didn't do it. And now i got to grieve that back. And that's tough. If you've really been hurt, for most people, that's tough. But I so, so encourage you to do the grieving, go through the process. If you get stuck in this critical parent role toward God, well, your relationship's over. I mean, it's... You'll be like a dozen, I mean, you're a dime a dozen, a person I've met on the street or a church or at the Y who said, I don't go to church, what happened? My mom died when I was given cancer. They're just giving God the bird. It's been 40 years later. That, like, that's it. They just, they're in a morally superior position to God. And if I let God off the hook because he should have done this, all that, what that really, really means, I've got to be sad. I've got to come to acceptance of what happened. But I'll feel like I'll feel better. I don't have to go through all that pain if I stay one up above him. Yeah. I've heard people, I still haven't forgiven God. Man, how, that's a scary spot to be. It's different if you're wounded, but if you're in a protest stage, man, you're going to lose that one. You were deluded. I mean, we really are. That's a sad spot to be. I'm going to move on. Let's have any questions about that. Because of time only. Is that okay? Yeah, good. So okay, that's what forgiveness is. And when I say the terms forgiving yourself, forgiving God, I don't use those much. So why do it? Uh, why do it? I, okay, I put these kind of almost in order of me, what I think is most important. Number one is I must remember that a disciple of Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus, I am living right now in God's forgiveness. And I love the parable, Matthew 18, 23. Matthew... Eighteen twenty-three. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents, which is a gargantuan amount. I mean, there's, that's like saying the lottery. I mean, brought to, there was that debt is unbelievable. Verse 25, and as he could not pay, everybody in the audience goes, of course not. I mean, you can't pay back a billion dollars. His Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Yeah, right. 
And out of pity for him, the Lord of the slave released him and forgave him the debt. What? You owed a billion dollars. But the same slave as he went out came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, which is a fraction. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay me what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, I will pay you. But he refused. That's how we're supposed to read that. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. They went and reported to the Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? The answer is yes. And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do the same. Every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from within or from your heart. Woo! And we can do numerous places if you want. In Colossians 2, 13, 3, 12, 1 John 2. I mean, Paul says explicitly, forgive others as we have been forgiven. As we have been forgiven. His forgiveness is the model and the method of why and how we are to forgive. So don't be like that man I just read in Matthew 18, 3. Oh, Lord, please have mercy on me. Oh, God has changed my life. He's forgiven me. He's forgiven. You little punk. And I've known well-intentioned Christians that I will name them nameless and nameless churches who will praise God about how much they've been forgiven and they hold grudges to everything that moves. You cross them one time. That is the definition. A grudge by definition means you haven't forgiven them. And that's exactly the point of Jesus' parable. And I must remember when I've got people I'm still, I have to forgive, I have to, number one, God's forgiven me of unimaginable. He has. I'm in a state of forgiveness. And if he does it, I should respond in kind. The one who is loved, forgiven much, loves much. I've got to do that. Again, some of you right now, maybe you're thinking, it was not that easy. I didn't say the pain and stuff is healed immediately. I'm talking about why do it. Why do it? Number one is because I'm in a state of forgiveness. I mean, I just am. And I, he's the model. He's the method. That's what Christians. Now, if I were a Muslim, it's different. You're not in a state of forgiveness. If you're a Hindu, you're not in a state of forgiveness. If you're, it's just not the same. But Christians, I am. Number two, remember how you too are not flawless. You too have sinned, and perhaps in huge ways, to others. Now, even though you may not have done this thing that was done to you, you are not more righteous than the other person. You and the other person are both in need of God's grace. I have found this to be difficult to think about and listen to when I'm in the middle of real rage toward the person. I know, but we don't want to hear that. We've simmered down a little bit. This is a good reminder. Okay, it's true. That is why am I try- do I need to forgive? Because I remember I too have needed forgiveness. I too have sometimes made accidental offenses. Sometimes I've done it on purpose. And maybe they've done it too, and we're both in need of grace. So those are two, right? And number three, and this is the one where the rubber meets the road, particularly for me, is three, as disciples of Jesus, we must forgive. Not kind of, not maybe, maybe, maybe. Go back to Matthew chapter six. We must forgive. Jesus commanded this to do. It wasn't a suggestion. Matthew six, verse 12 which I preached a long time ago in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 12. And forgive us our debts, which is a good Jewish way of saying sins, as we also, or the Greek can be as we also, or to the degree that we have forgiven our debtors. Think about that. God, please forgive me as much as I have forgiven other people. That's what Jesus said, not David, not Oprah. Jesus said this. I want to be forgiven. <laughs> I want to be forgiven, and I need to be forgiven. And Jesus said, good. That's how you pray to God. You want to be the kind of person who's a forgiving person. And that's Jesus' point. Most scholars agree. His point is be a forgiving kind of person. Verse 14, to make the point again, if you forgive others their trespasses, a different Greek word, but the same point, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. It sure seems to be the point that Jesus is saying, if you do not have a forgiving heart, a forgiving disposition, you can't be, as it were, born of God. You don't have his spirit. You're not his disciple. 
Because disciples of Jesus have a forgiving heart, a forgiving mindset. We've got to do it. So far, I've not said one word about, you know, does that mean overnight? Well, that depends on the offense. All I'm saying is why forgive? Because we are commanded to. I mean, we're just simply, and I'm telling you what, when the rubber really meets through, and I'm having a really hard time, I've gone back to that verse many, many times. I go, okay, God. <laughs> Boy, I don't want to at all, but you said I had to. So stink and help me because I've got to do it. In Matthew 18, 21, 22. I thought you were alluding to this earlier, Daniel, but maybe you were. In Matthew 18, 21, 22. Peter came and said to him, Lord, if, if, um, if actually is a, this is kind of hard. He literally says, if a brother, if a brother, some translation said a member of the church. He means a, a fellow disciple. So the fellow disciple Jesus sins against me. Now, I think it's in Luke's version. He says sins. And so it's difficult if he just means he sins or sins against me. Probably means me. How often, uh, uh, sorry, that's from, that's a different, sorry. That's a, it's come later on in the chapter. Forgive what I just said. Lord, if another member of the a brother sins against me, how often should I forgive? Seven times? Now, certain rabbis, as what we can tell, said three times was really righteous. So people give Peter, that dummy, seven times, she should have known better. That's a good answer. Seven times? Yeah, high five, I'm gracious. That's what he expected Jesus to say. Good for you, Pete. Big Pete, that's my rock right there, dog. Seven times? Jesus says, not seven times. He goes, oh, really? Forever. 77 just means you don't stop. Now, for a long time, I used to think that means, I thought that meant that Jesus means forgive of the same sins over and over. I don't think that's what he means. I don't think that's what he means. I think he means if someone just sins against you. Because what disciples are supposed to do is then repent of that. Stop doing that thing. But what if the next day they do a different offense? The same brother. You forgive him again. And then, of course, Colossians 3, 12 to 13. We must forgive others as we have been forgiven. Those are great verses to memorize too, if you haven't. In my humble opinion, forgiveness is one of the most constant reminders that I am not like normal pagans, normal non-Christians. It is at the heart of being Christian and Christian behavior. It's one of the few ethical commandments that Jesus gives that constantly reminds me that I'm not like the world because they do not forgive. They hold grudges. They hold it forever. They want to show their power. They're rubbing your face forever. Christians don't do that. We just don't do that. We don't. Well, David, I'm not there yet. Uh, okay. But that's the why. <laughs> why should it be our journey? Why is our goal? So I encourage people when I counsel them, I say, it, it has to, if you're a Christian, it must be your destination. Now, maybe you feel like it's 300 miles away in this curvy, windy, torturous road. Fine. But you've got to get on the road to a forgiveness if you're a Christian. If not, then don't call yourself a Christian. Just say, no, I'm just going to always. That's, I mean, unless I'm, unless I'm completely misreading Jesus. And if I am, please correct me because I want to get him right. I want to get Jesus right. I don't want to be mistaken myself. It seems to me this is at the core. So those are my big three reasons why at first, why we must do it. One is I'm being forgiven. That's a good reminder that forgiveness is imperative. Two, I remember that I'm also flawless. I'm not flawless. I said I am flawless. That's, I, you know that I'm flawless. Look, it's a whole parade. And three, we must forgive. And then emotionally, resentment or unforgiveness is what the same, as unforgiveness is resentment. It is an internal wound. It is an internal wound. Resentment is bitter indignation at having been treated unfairly. Resentment is like an eternal sickness that damages you. It does. And studies demonstrate that. It really does. Um, unresolved anger, unresolved resentment literally affects the brain, cardiovascular issues, um, longevity on earth. People who have not resentment, they, they live shorter lives. I mean, it has been demonstrated. It's a scientific fact. Uh, the resentment and bitterness that exists with unforgiveness causes... Again, damage physically, spiritually. People often feel as if there's a barrier between them and God. That's very common. I just don't feel like God's there anymore. I feel like he's not listening anymore. Oftentimes, well, let's talk about that. Maybe it's woundedness. Or maybe you're really holding on to some really grudge against someone or even him. The baggage will not go away unresolved. Not forgiving is, not forgiving is paying a life sentence for a crime you didn't commit. 
you pay the price for anger and resentment. You're in jail forever. And they did it. The other person will receive whatever God wants to give them. Leave that to God. If you don't forgive, the person wins twice the time you were hurt and the lifetime of anger you keep with you. Don't let them win twice. And don't pay the price for a crime you didn't commit. 